Okay, welcome to chapter 28. Chapter 28 is going to be about protists. So up until this point, we were just talking about prokaryotes, and now we're talking about the first eukaryotes that came about, and we'll talk about how that happened. Um, so protists, in the, in the majority of them, are going to be unicellular, um, and so they're considered to be the simplest organisms. But don't think that all protists are unicellular. There are going to be some that are multicellular. Um, very, very, very complex because if you think about it, you've got one cell most of the time and it's doing all the jobs that we have specialized cells to do. So the cell is actually very complex. Um, there are some that are going to be plant-like, some animal-like, and some fungi-like. And this is one of the reasons that they're thinking of splitting the kingdom protista into five or six separate ones just because it's such a diverse kingdom. So you've got photoautotrophs, which are going to be ones that have chloroplasts, you're going to have heterotrophs that ingest or absorb food particles, and then you're going to have a very scientific sounding mixotroph, and those are going to combine photosynthesis and heterotrophic nutrition. So um, like your euglena that we looked um, or may look at, right? Those guys are photosynthetic, but they actually act more animal-like, so they're kind of in between. <clears throat> so a lot of diversity here. Um, most protists are going to be moving around and they'll have either cilia or a flagella or something, but then you're going to have some that are attached to a substrate. So a lot of diversity there. Um, a lot of diversity in the habitat. One thing that they're all going to have in common is that they all do like some sort of water-related habitat. Um, so that's going to be one thing, but they could be fine in you know, the dirt, they could be fine in a puddle, they could be found in leaf litter. Leaf litter is just when all the leaves fall on the forest floor and start rotting. Um, a lot of them could be the big primary producers in food chains, so if you think about plankton in the ocean. Um, and then there's some that are going to be mutualistic that will actually help an organism. So there's protists that live in the guts of herbivores and they help them to digest cellulose. And then you've got some that are parasitic, like the one that causes malaria called plasmodium. So it's kind of all over the board. Um, as far as the life cycles go, I'm going to show you like a basic one, and the good news is if you learn it with this one, it's actually the same for plants and fungus, um, so for the next couple chapters, if you know this, you're good to go. <clears throat> um, so the only way that they're going to have variation with these life cycles is going to be how long they spend in each cycle, um, whether they skip certain parts, but I'm just going to show you the basics of it. Uh, here we go. Okay. So this is a basic life cycle for a protist. Um, so we'll start at the zygote. So the, the zygote is going to develop into a structure called a sporophyte. Oh, crap. Sorry. Um, and then the sporophyte is actually, if you look at the name, sporophyte, its job is to make spores. Okay. So you've got the zygote turning into a sporophyte. Sporophyte's job is to make spores. So the next part is going to be the spores. The spores are eventually going to mature and turn into what are called gametophytes. Now, if a sporophyte makes spores, what do you think gametophytes make? Gametes, right? So a gametophyte is either going to make egg or sperm. I lost my mouse. There it is. Um, so you've got your egg and your sperm. And then when egg and sperm come together, they make a zygote. Okay, so we'll go through that one more time. You've got a zygote. That'll develop into a sporophyte. Sporophyte's job is to make spores. When the spores mature, they become gametophytes, and the gametophytes are going to make gametes, egg and sperm. Those will come together, form a zygote, and now you've got the whole cycle. So some are going to spend most of their life as a sporophyte, some are going to spend most of their life as a gametophyte. It depends on the organism and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's the basics of that, and I actually <clears throat> list that in order. So sporophyte makes spores, those turn into gametophytes, gametophytes make gametes, that, those fuse to form a zygote. And then this little paragraph down here kind of puts all that together. So I wouldn't worry too much about haploid and diploid numbers, I just wanted to put that there if that helps you understand the cycle. Alright, now as far as um, where these guys come from, um, what we think is that it came through a process called endosymbiosis. Oh, and I don't have a picture. And basically all that is is um, you had some bacteria that started living in other bacteria, and that's how you got organelles, especially like mitochondria and chloroplasts. 
And then um, anything that is made of like membrane, like the um, ER or the Golgi apparatus, those were thought to be from infoldings of the cell membrane. So that's how we got the organelles to form these eukaryotes known as protists. Um, all right, so what we're going to do now is kind of go through these supergroups of protists and talk about the different ones that are in these supergroups. So this is a way that we've kind of divided up the kingdom, but once again, not a lot. I mean, the first group makes sense to me. The other ones, it's like, I don't know why these are together. Um, and I'm sure it's from DNA evidence, obviously, but it just bothers me. Anyway, so um, the first group that we're going to talk about contains um, euglena, Trypanosoma and um, Giardia. Now, what's going to make them in this group is that they actually have like a little excavated feeding groove on them. So, here's a picture of Euglena. Those are the green guys that were zooming around. You saw those in Bio 111. Um, Trypanosoma, that's going to be these little worm like things that you see here. These are red blood cells. This is an electron microscope picture. And these cause um, sleeping sickness. And then Giardia, which is this lovely little dude here, and that can make you sick if you get poisoned with Giardia. You could get vomiting and diarrhea and that fun stuff. <clears throat> All right. Now the next group is very, very diverse, Chromalveolata. And um, this is going to include a whole bunch. So I'll kind of just go through the pictures with you and show you. So the first group that's going to be included in this are what are called dinoflagellates. And dinoflagellates um, are called that because they have a flagellum. Um, and then they're called dino because they're like the dinosaurs of this group. Like they have like these like hard plates that are around them. And so this is a picture of one here. Um, this is another picture of one here. So you can kind of see the plates and then you can see the flagellum. Um, but these guys are going to be responsible for something called red tides. This is a picture of a red tide here. And so when you have a huge bloom of dinoflagellates, it can literally turn the um, ocean bright red. And um, this is something that has happened in the past. It's just kind of a normal process. But now they're seeing them happening a lot more because of fertilizer runoff. And these guys love fertilizer, so they just kind of go out of control. Now, the danger with a red tide is not only that it turns the ocean bright red. Here's a picture of it really, really red. Um, but if you go to the beach and you have like asthma or any sort of like bronchial issues, these are going to make you very sick. Um, I went swimming during a red tide in college because so I was like, ah, I don't believe that. And oh man, I definitely got a sore throat and all sorts of stuff. Um, the other way you can know a red tide is happening is because the beach will look like this. This is all carcasses of crabs and fish and, you know, sharks and dolphins. I mean, like everybody gets sick from a red tide. So it's not exactly the best thing, but it does happen. All right. Um, also in this group is going to be plasmodium. Plasmodium is going to be what causes malaria. This is a red blood cell here that's been infected with it, and so it's like this little kind of horseshoe-shaped worm <coughs> that's in there. Another one in this group, paramecium. You looked at these in Bio 111 as well. Paramecium are clear, and they're like zooming around. You find them in like pond water and that type of stuff. Totally not harmful or anything. Um, and also in this group are going to be the um, diatoms. Let me make sure I'm keeping up with where we are. Okay, good. Um, diatoms are super cool. Really, really, really pretty and very geometric looking, right? You've got circles and triangles and squares and things. And here's some more pictures of them. Very, very pretty. And these guys have a little test, which is like a shell made of silica. And um, that's like glass. And that's why they're so gorgeous looking. And you find these in plankton as well, but they're not really harmful. They might cause like a little bit of an algae bloom, but that's about it. Um, it's kind of cool because people will arrange them like this and then frame a picture of them and use it as art because they are really gorgeous creatures. So kind of neat. Um, and then let me make sure I'm keeping up okay. All right. Here's our lovely gold, and also I didn't put a picture in here of brown algae, but brown algae is included in this group too. Now, um, these guys are um, awesome. This is actually one in this picture called sargassum, and um, this floats in huge mats, and they have their own ecosystems under them because fish use them for kind of protection. Um, but these can also be used as an emulsifier, and that means it makes things a little thicker. So like in pudding, they put it all the time, ice cream dripless paints, a lot of like lipstick. Um, so this stuff is in a lot of the products that we use. Um, so that's kind of neat. 
All right, the next group that we're going to talk about is called Rhizaria. And Rhizaria is going to include the infamous amoeba. So here's an amoeba with memory. It's little pseudopods trying to grab that piece of food there. Um, also in this group is going to be foraminifera. So these guys look like miniature seashells. And what's cool about these guys is they can be used as what are called index fossils, which means that there are very specific foraminifera that were alive for a very short period of time. And so if you find a fossil and you find a specific type of foraminifera next to it, you can actually key out that species and figure out how old that fossil next to it was because they were only alive for a short period of time. So that's cool and useful for them. And then the last group that's included in this is going to be the radiolarians. Um, beautiful group again. Um, very similar looking to diatoms, except they're more delicate. They have those little things sticking off of them, projections. And they use those like a parachute. So like they'll float up in the water column during the day and at night they don't want to sink. And so they have those to kind of keep them from sinking too much like a parachute. And some of them aren't super gorgeous. Here's one here. Eh, whatever, right? All right, the next group is going to be Archaea plastida. And this is only going to include two types of organisms, the red algae, which you see here. And this is something that we use to make agar. So um, anytime you use a petri dish and it has that growth medium in it that has a consistency of like jello, that is made from red algae. And then green algae, there's tons of examples of these. This is Chlamydomonas, this is Volvox. Um, and green algae is, once again, a great primary producer. Right? Now this last group we're going to talk about, Uniconta. These ones are going to include the protists that are kind of fungus-like and also kind of animal-like. And it's going to include slime molds, which are lovely little creatures. I mean, the name already explains that. But um, basically what happens with a slime mold is it's going to produce something called a slug. And I think I've got a picture, yeah. Here's a picture of a slug right here. And um, this actually moves. So this will actually move across the forest floor until it finds a place where it's suitable for it to grow into its fruiting structure and its fruiting body, and then it will release spores. So here is a picture of one that has grown up to release its spores. So really crazy. And um, what's scary is some of these guys can cause pretty bad infections. So this is a picture of someone who's been infected with slime mold infection. Not fun, right? Anyway. The other one that's going to be included in this group is going to be these guys called coanoflagellates. And coano translates into collar, and flagellate is obviously a flagellum. And if you look here, it has a flagellum, and then there's a little collar around it. Now, the reason I'm really pointing these guys out to you is because when we start talking about animals, there's a hypothesis that the first animal, which is sponges, came about from a bunch of these guys living together. And I have pretty strong evidence that I'll show you when we get to that chapter to back that up. So that's going to be those guys. So those are all of the super groups. And you can see the diversity there. I mean, there's definitely a lot of evidence on why we should probably split it up. All right, the last part here is just talking about the important roles that protists can play in the environment. One of them is that they can be symbiotic. And so I have a picture here of, um, see all the like kind of greenish on this one and the brown on this one? Those are um, a type of protist called zooxanthellae. And those are dinoflagellates that are going to live on coral, and they're actually going to help the coral to survive. It's um, going to be an obligate symbiotic relationship. And so what happens is these zooxanthellae are going to be photosynthetic, so they're going to provide the coral with nutrients that they need. And then the coral, in return, is going to provide them with a nice place to live and safety because the coral can sting things away, right? So that right there is why they don't want you touching coral, because you could wipe that stuff off, and that's what kills the coral. Um, there's also examples that I put in your notes of um, termites and how they have those protists in their guts to help them digest wood, right? That'd be another thing. Now, the last important ecological role is not a small one, um, and that's that there's a lot of those that are photosynthetic, the green algae and that type of stuff. And those are going to be really important primary producers that are going to remove carbon dioxide from our environment and hopefully provide a food source for the uh, food chain to kind of go off of. So those are protists, kind of a short chapter, but really diverse and really, really cool organisms.